Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon. I hope you enjoy the luncheons. Uh, welcome to the plenary session two. Uh, I am Ju Yan Kim, the president of Hyundai Research Institution. It is my great honor to serve as a moderator at this session of excellent speakers and discussant. The topic our session is imperative, the sense of global citizenship and social responsibility. During the last 60 years since World War II, the technological development of science and the development of world economy are tremendous. We have technologies to send people to the moon and are capable to produce enough food for the whole 6.5 billion on the earth. But we still have one billion who are suffering in famine and malnutrition on the other side of the world. Other than that, global warming, environmental problems, wars and terrors, human rights violations from all over the world covers the newspaper and TV screens every day. Under these circumstances, the corporate social responsibility and the duties of individuals as global citizens are more important. Maybe it is time to assess how we are educating our children to cope with these issues. In this session, I hope speakers will touch upon the, means, the meanings of social responsibility and the role of global citizens. Now, uh, let me introduce our distinguished guest and uh, discussant. From my left, uh, Jeffrey Pepper, uh, professor of uh, organizational behavior at the Graduate School of Business, Stanford University since 1979, and he got his PhD from Stanford, and he is well known to Koreans through his books. He already wrote certain books and the numerous articles he published. Uh, the rest of his resume is too long to illiterate all of them. So this is Dr. Pepper. Would you raise your hand and then they can recognize? OK. <laughs> Give hands. And then next is uh, Francis Piran, the Chief uh, Human Resource Office of the Beer and Melinda Gates Foundation. Uh, Piran has an extensive background in human resource management from uh, DuPont Company and the Miller Brewing Company and any, many other firms. He got a Master of Science in Management from uh, Indiana Wesleyan University and got uh, a BA in business school in Arizona State University. That is a famous school that I graduated my PhD there. <laughs> so we happen to meet here. And then uh, you can recognize who is Piran. And then next is uh, Joseph Policy. Uh, he's the president of Juilliard School. The Juilliard School is well known in Korea. And Joseph Policy served at the school as president 20 Six years? Is it right? 27 years. That's amazing, right? He's the one who developed the Juilliard School of today. The policy is really a talented person. He holds three graduate degrees in music. From here, he got the doctor and master of musical art and master of music also. But he has BA in political science and then got the master in international relations. Right, as uh, his excellent careers he has. And then the last one from the left uh, is uh, Tony Liru. He is headmaster of Eton College. He studied headmaster Eton College from 2002. Uh, before he came to the Eton, he served as a headmaster of Chigwell, Chigwell School. Yes, and Oakham's. He is also educated in Eton and Cambridge. Currently, he is serving as a vice president of the International Boys' School Coalition and chairman of the World Reading Schools Association. Now, please join me in welcoming them once again.
Uh, we going to spend each speaker is about 20 to 25 minutes, and then we discuss for each person about 10 minutes. And then after that, uh, we will open the floor for the, for the discussions. So first, we are going to start from Professor uh, Jeffrey Pepper. Please, please welcome me, Ms. Proud. So it's a pleasure to be with you today and to talk about my subject, which is the title, I think, tells it all. Why are polar bears more important than people and money more important than both? To talk about sustainability as we talk about it and to talk about global citizenship is to talk about a world in which we have lost our way in a variety of different ways. We have lost our way in terms of what is important, and we have certainly lost our way in terms of our focus on human beings. Let me give you some examples. If you were to look at how we measure economic progress, and in fact, at lunch today, I was sitting next to a person, and we were talking about the Korean economy. And I said, I understand the Korean economy is doing quite well. The one is strong. Growth is up. He said, ah, yes, the Korean economy is doing great. Unfortunately, we have high unemployment. Many people do not have jobs. We certainly in the United States have gotten accustomed to talking about the economy in terms of the rate of growth of GDP. So according to the National Bureau for Economic Research, the recession ended more than a year ago. But there are few people in the U.S. labor force who would tell you the recession has ended at all. Similarly, we look at the success of the economy in terms of corporate profits. And at least in the United States, corporate profits are now a higher share of the economy than they have ever been, and they're doing quite well. Even many of the banks that brought us into financial distress are doing quite well. And of course, the stock market. While it has not recovered all of its ground, it too has done quite well. So we tend to think about the economy in terms of these things. GDP, profits, the economy. In the US, of course, and I think this is increasingly true in industrialized countries, it is not just the case that we have had a jobless recovery, though we have. We have had a jobless boom. Between 2000 and 2008, the only sectors of the United States economy that created jobs were education, health, and public service, all sectors funded by the government. And that funding is gone and will probably not come back. In manufacturing and in construction and in many other major sectors of the economy, we never had a boom in terms of people. We measure economic performance way too narrowly. So, for instance, in a headline in the New York Times, August 13th, 2010, as I was preparing for this talk, Detroit goes from gloom to economic bright spot. That's measured by company profits, not by wages, which have been re reduced, particularly for new employees, not by employment, which has been cut by more than 300,000 jobs just in 2008, as the number of big three auto assembly plants fell from 66 to 40 just since the year 2000. How can the New York Times, which my friends at Fox News will tell you is a liberal newspaper, pro-worker, say Detroit goes from gloom to economic bright spot? only if you look at everything except human beings, which, by the way, we've gotten quite accustomed to doing. Nor is Detroit as a city doing so well, which has lost population steadily over the last several decades, is beset with home foreclosures and a depressed real estate market, and is in fact such a distressed area that Fortune magazine has a team of reporters in Detroit saying 
trying to write positive stories about a city that is essentially dying. We have come to define everything as a market, and we have come to use economic language to talk about everything. So houses, we used to think of houses were like a place to live or maybe raise your family. But now houses are in fact a way of taking an option, a real option, on the real estate market and making a bet on whether their prices will rise or fall. Daycare used to be something that you worried about if you were a mother or a father to take care of your children. It is now a service provided by companies traded on the New York Stock Exchange. And whereas child care was at one time a problem for parents, it's now an economic activity that is bought, sold, and traded. Our language reflects our values. Human capital, human resources. Dennis Bakke, former founding CEO of the amazing electric power generating company, AES, said to me once, he said, you know, human resources, steel is a resource. People are people. But human capital, social capital, our language is very economics in its orientation. We think about how many people we have met, not how many, how close friends we have. And of course, if you go to the doctor in the United States, my first word of advice to you is don't. But if you should have to, you will see that the language of healthcare is now the language of costs. I sit on the Stanford Committee for Faculty and Staff Human Resources as we talk about healthcare costs. And I, my only role on this committee, I have decided, is to remind my colleagues on this committee that we are dealing with human beings and their health, not with compensable units, not with cost efficiency, not with deferred benefits that have to be put onto the Stanford University balance sheet or anything else. We have lost our focus on human beings. Even when our, the company chooses to focus on social responsibility, the focus is almost exclusively on the environment, not on people. So it is true that everybody is going green, like Kermit the Frog of Sesame Street, we used to say, I guess it's hard being green, but I guess now today it's easy being green since everybody is green. Most forward-thinking companies are trying to go green. Businesses have appointed echo managers. They are tracing and measuring their, um, uh, their carbon footprint and their use of energy and their use of natural resources. And they report these things publicly. What they don't report nearly as often, maybe at all publicly, is what they do with their people. The reason, of course, why companies have gone green is because it saves them money from reduced waste. It helps them with consumer image and brand building. It helps them recruit and retain employees, which is all to the good. And the evidence suggests that the profits come from being green. And that is, I think, exactly correct. But there is much less concern with human sustainability. Walmart, for the last six years, has been con 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 committed to environmental sustainability. They talk about their green initiatives, what they have done to their roofs, what they have done to their trucking, what they have done to their packaging, how they have taken waste out. What Walmart does not talk about is how they pay less than other retailers and have a higher percentage of their employees who have to make use of social assistance programs because they cannot afford medical care or in many instances to feed their families. British Petroleum, now called BP. BP stands for, as part of their advertising campaign, Beyond Petroleum. However, they paid an $87 million record fine for safety violations in their Texas City, Texas refinery following an explosion that killed 15 people. And when they failed to correct the problems that made their refinery an unsafe place to act, to work, then paid a $200 million fine. 
Company reporting on corporate social responsibility typically focuses on the environment. I defy you to find me a company that reports on how well it does with its people. Human health, let me suggest to you, is one reasonable, plausible, and in fact probably necessary measure of social sustainability. Health, both physical and mental health, and mortality are critically important indicators of how well our social institutions are functioning. Sir Michael Marmot, the famous British epidemiologist and physician, has said, health functions as a kind of social accountant. If health suffers, it tells us that human needs are not being met. And what do we know about organizational effects on human health? There are many, and they are profound. Decisions about health insurance in the United States affect health, mortality, and the risk of bankruptcy. Literally hundreds of studies have documented the fact that the uninsured have worse health outcomes than the insured. Uninsured adults are less likely to use preventive medical services, such as blood pressure and cholesterol screening, mammography, and pap smear. Lack of health insurance is associated with approximately 45,000 excess deaths annually in the United States. And so I tell my friends who are opposed to the health reform in the United States that they certainly have a right to do that, but that they need to be called for what they are, murderers. Because in fact, there are 45,000 people each year dying from the absence of health insurance. Work stress and job design affects health. Employees with high job strain, which is a combination of high work demands coupled with low control over their work, have a more than twofold risk in cardiovascular mortality. In a study of British civil servants, men in the lowest job ranks had one and a half times the risk of developing heart disease compared to people in the highest grade difference in the psychosocial work experience, not body mass index, cholesterol, or anything else, accounted for this difference. So lack of insurance kills people. Work strain kills people. Work hours affects health. A study in California found a positive association between hours worked and hypertension. The National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health has published a, a report summarizing numerous studies relating work hours and shift work to a variety of negative outcomes ranging from cardiovascular disease to injuries, other illnesses, and psychological pro problems ranging from depression to alcoholism to drug abuse. Vacations and leaves affect health. Women who took maternity leave were nearly four times less likely to deliver their babies through a cesarean section than did women who did not. Data from the Framingham Heart Study at Framingham, Massachusetts, found that women who took a vacation once every six years or less were almost eight times as likely to develop cardiovascular disease as women who went on vacation two or more times a year. So yes, overwork is bad for your health. Work co family conflict affects health. A study of 2,700 employed adults found that employees who reported experiencing work family conflict were between two and 30 times more likely to, to experience a clinically significant mental health problem such as mood, substance abuse, anxiety, or stress. Higher, leaves of higher levels of work family conflict are associated with more absenteeism, and sickness in the workplace. Inequalities, including the wage inequalities created inside organizations, affect health. One study published in a peer-reviewed journal argued that the loss of life from income inequality is comparable to the combined loss of life from lung cancer, diabetes, motor vehicle crashes, HIV AIDS, suicide and homicides combined. 
Layoffs and economic insecurity affect health. Unemployed people are twice as likely to be depressed. Sickness absence was all twice the time among those who remained employed following downsizing. Among the respondents with no evidence of violent behavior, those laid off were six times more likely to engage in violence. And layoffs kill people. One study found that unemployed people were twice as likely to commit suicide. A study in Sweden found that overall mortality among men increased 44% in the first four years following a layoff. Losing a job because of an establishment closure increased the odds of fair or poor health by 54%. You can read this for yourself. So what I have told you is, number one, we tend to look at the world in terms of economics, stock price, profits. We have overlooked the profound effect of organizations on human health and well-being, even though health and well-being is a critical indicator of social system functioning. And I have told you that organizations do what they do and how they work, how much control they give people, whether or not they permit them to take vacations, whether or not they put them in shift work, how many work hours they give them, and whether or not they lay them off, which is probably the best or worst thing they can do, have profound effects on human health and well-being. It is interesting to me that we have this emphasis on human on, on the environment over human well-being, even though we are concerned with health care costs and even when numerous employers have employee engagement initiatives. There are obviously employer advantages to employee health, cost advantages that result from reduced turnover, again, customer branding and brand building, and the evidence suggests clearly, and this chart comes from the Great Place to Work Institute, that companies that are great places to work outperform economically. So just as in the environmental world there's a connection between being green and being profitable, so in the human world there is a connection between being employee friendly and being profitable. Most, about, most of the arguments I get about why we can't do any of this are the same as the arguments about environmental sustainability, distrust of government regulation, concern about costs and making us uncompetitive, arguments about the validity of the science that underlies the reforms, and by the way, the data that I've given you is a small sample of the data that demonstrates the connections between employee actions and human health. And that there's an important issue about the externalities that we as employers impose on other people. In the case of environmental pollution and environmental sustainability, sustainability the argument is over. We now in the U.S. and many other places require environmental impact statements. There are clean air and clean water laws. There are green expectations for business. In the case of human sustainability, let me argue, the discussion has yet to begin, and I hope it will very soon. We can argue and talk about what's the difference between the environment and human health and sustainability. One of the reasons why we may care more about polar bears is that polar bears seem to be these poor creatures who don't get to choose their working conditions. And I have some of my friends who say, well, people choose where they want to go to work, so if they work in toxic workplaces, they've chosen to do it. Let me suggest that there's a big issue of public measurement and visibility. There's issues in legitimacy. One of our themes of this talk is education. One of the themes of our panel is education. And for those of us who teach business students, we ought to be concerned. According to the first Aspen Institute study of values, while in business school, students come to place more emphasis on shareholders and less emphasis on employees, quality, and customers. According to the 2008 Aspen Institute study, business school students report being less able to deal with ethical conflicts the longer they are in business school. Business school students, both undergraduate and, business, and graduate, cheat more than the students in any other field, according to studies done over the last 20 years by Don McCabe and the Center for Academic Integrity. High school and college cheating is widespread, 
And there are very few consequences for people caught cheating, at least in the United States. Uh, so we're basically teaching people to cheat, which is a problem. One of the other issues, of course, is invisibility. Companies report on their carbon emissions and do environmental impact statements, but they do not report on the physical and mental health status of their workforce and the effects of their actions on company well-being. Little attention is paid by the media either. There is no oversight. Well, my friends complain about too much government regulation. There are actually fewer people overseeing wage and hour compliance, compliance, workplace, and mine safety than there were 25 years ago when the economy was smaller. States have also cut their oversight. And with the decline in unionization, employees have no power to stand up for themselves. So let me end with what's to be done. I think there are four things we ought to do. Number one, we ought to, as media and as academics and as citizens, we ought to both demand and report on a regular basis information so that any time a company lays people off, you go to the studies which demonstrate how many people that will kill and hold that up because layoffs kill people just as surely as anything else. Secondly, I do believe there is a possibility for infectious social action in the world of the internet and the web and Facebook and Twitter and everything else. It is possible for human beings to organize themselves and to put pressure on the society and on government. It's illustrated in the Dragonfly Effect, a new book out by my colleagues Jennifer Ocker and her husband Andy Smith. Third, I do believe that there is a role for government intervention and, re and regulation and oversight, just as companies would not let, just as governments would not let organizations put pollutants into the air and water because of the external costs that other people have to pay to clean up. They should not, they should also be concerned about the external costs imposed by overwork, no vacations, no health insurance, no job control, layoffs, and all the other things that adversely affect employee health and well-being that the governments then have to pay for. And finally, I do not believe we can wait for enlightened uh, corporate self-interest to solve the problems I have enumerated because I have been waiting. I've actually been writing about this for decades, and I'm still waiting. Thank you very much. Now, yeah, Piran, your turn. First of all, I want to say thanks to the HR Global Forum, the sponsors, and the organizers for selecting an important array of topics for us to get to chat about, to discuss, and to think further about. And also for you, the participants, who are willing to engage and use your time to dig deeper on these issues. I want to use my time to share some of the lessons I've learned from my position and also from my employer's mission. And to that end, I'll use our topic, the need to build a better sense of global citizenship and social responsibility, as a bit of a case study to illustrate both. As you heard, I worked for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. The foundation is teaming up with partners around the world to take on some of the biggest global challenges we face. Extreme poverty and poor health in developing countries and the failures of our education system. The organization was founded and its mission predicated on the simple yet profound belief that every life has equal worth, that where you live shouldn't determine if you live or whether you're able to fulfill your potential. Bill and Melinda made a conscious decision to focus on a few issues because they believe a targeted focus allows for the greatest possible impact. And in the hopes of achieving impact, the foundation targets the places where the elimination of barriers 
can help people make the most of their lives. For each issue we work on, we fund innovative ideas that could help remove these barriers, such as new technologies to help farmers in developing countries grow more food and earn more money, new tools to prevent and to treat deadly illnesses and diseases, and new methods to help teachers and students in the classroom. The mission, focused as it is, creates an interesting challenge for human resources. First, being a grantor of dollars to intermediaries and organizations is a different work product than what's produced in most environments. Second, when you look within our targeted mission, you see that we fund work in a variety of areas such as vaccine development and delivery, seed technology, curriculum technology, and the list goes on. So, leading human resources at the Gates Foundation is like leading HR for a pharmaceutical company, an agribusiness company, an educational institution, a manufacturer, and when you add our commitment to advocacy, you can throw in a PR firm as well. So we look for deep subject matter expertise. And that's oftentimes really hard. We're frequently talking, to, talking about forgotten diseases where there are only a handful of people in the world still focused and continuing their deep expertise. But deep expertise isn't enough. They also have to be collaborative and communicate well. We're a small organization, relatively speaking. So they may not have the resources and the level of support that they're used to having in their previous jobs. Therefore, they have to be able to work in highly collaborative ways. Additionally, we often ask them to convene industry experts, national and world leaders on certain topics. So you're pulling what can be two very different skill sets, deep subject matter expertise and the need to be highly collaborative and making sure that we demand that of everyone in our organization. Without question, we have incredibly broad and exacting requirements for who we need. And that isn't just unique to our organization. Today, almost every organization needs individuals who are capable of doing the work in front of them while also seeing the bigger picture and then going beyond that and impacting it. We ask people to know a great deal but that knowledge is just the first foot in the door. We ask something even bigger than that of our employees. It's not just about deep subject matter expertise and a broad skill set. It's not just about the ability to work closely with others and do great things with our resources. We also expect them to, to subscribe to a certain philosophy, to a certain worldview. We expect them to have a deep commitment to global citizenship and social responsibility and to feel compelled to act on that commitment. So let me explain a bit further. People tend to think of a life well lived as having three distinct phases, learning, earning, and then returning. First, you get an education, develop a skill, you learn. Next, you get a job, you build a career, you buy a home, you earn. And finally, towards the end of your life, after you've learned all you needed and earned all you could use, you give back. You do some good. You return. There's nothing wrong with this historical view. No one can deny that a life well lived begins with learning, includes adequate earning, and in the end, can be a life well lived with returning. However, and this gets to the topic of our session, education needs to advance our understanding of the challenges of an increasingly interconnected world. For example, if you want to understand a disease like malaria, you need to understand biology. 
both of the mosquito and the parasite, which is complicated. On top of that, you need to understand things like climate change, because that increases, increasingly determines the range of the disease. And if you want to fight malaria, you have to understand sociology, human migration patterns, and social norms that lead to exposure. The same goes for virtually every challenge we face. But educating for an interconnected world goes beyond that. Today's global citizens need more than an understanding of the world challenges. They also need to be educated to feel a sense of both urgency and agency in improving the world. So what the Gates Foundation strives to do is first, seek people who have a depth and breadth of expertise. In addition, we seek those with a worldview that recognizes life stages earning, learning, and returning as happening in concert. We want people who don't think of their last day in school as their last day of learning. The kinds of people who are intellectually curious, always trying to digest new information and new material. The kind that are excited about the possibility of gaining knowledge outside of their area of expertise. People who keep learning even when they're earning. We want people who see the idea of giving back to the world not as a luxury to be done at the end of their career, but as something to de dedicate a career to. The kind of people who see their vocation as their avocation, who make social responsibility the central tenet of their lives. Those who seek out careers that feed their souls instead of simply feeding their finances. I'm talking about the kind of people who volunteer their time on weekends at a local food bank or make contributions to organizations doing great things in the developing world. I'm also talking about the kind of people who forego a career in corporate law for one providing legal aid to the poor or those who spend a career developing an area of expertise and then use it when they've learned to make the, and then use it to make a difference in the world. I consider myself very fortunate. My job at the Gates Foundation affords me exactly that. By doing my job, I get to give back. In the US, starting about 50 years ago, the government created some programs that would encourage people to do the same thing. We created the Peace Corps, asking new graduates to dedicate two years of their lives to fighting poverty in the developing world before they began their career. We also created AmeriCorps, which sends volunteers to help underserved communities. And not long ago, an incredible organization called Teach for America was founded. It called on new graduates to teach students in some of the world's most challenging schools. More than 20,000 have heeded that call, and so far, because, of this, because so many recognize the passion and fulfillment that comes with that kind of giving, more than two-thirds of them remain in education. So that's returning, earning, and learning all at the same time. Still, for the most part, we live in a, in a society where these things don't happen all at once. And that, I believe, is one important thing that we can change. So much good can be done in the world. So much can be accomplished. That much is clear. So the question we should be asking ourselves is really, how do we do it? I think that begins with instilling in every one of us a set of core values and principles that have social responsibility at the center. It requires all of our learners, whether young adults, young students or, or seasoned adults, to embrace what it means to be a global citizen, to look beyond themselves, beyond the horizon in front of them, and feel in the gut exactly what's at stake. We have to start young. 
We have to give kids the kind of education opportunities that will let them see the world through different eyes. We should encourage volunteerism, make it a requirement of graduation even. We should promote internships and volunteer trips abroad so that before students fully formulate what they want to do with their careers, they can experience the harder truths of the world. We want them, though, not just to feel the weight of these challenges, but also the fulfillment and reward that comes from confronting them. Of course, this doesn't have to be something that's top down. Families can play a central role. Whether it's talking about world events at the dinner table, or taking kids on vacations that involve volunteering their time, parents can instill these values in their children. Organizations can step up and make a commitment too. At the Gates Foundation, for example, employees are encouraged to pursue community service, to volunteer their time to causes that really matter to them. And they can do it on foundation time. The Gates Foundation even offers to triple any financial contribution an employee makes to charity. But you don't have to have a three to one match or paid time off in order to focus on doing good in your life. One of the things I do personally is keep a list of things I want to do in my lifetime. I've already crossed off about half of it and I keep adding new things as well. But as the list has grown, it's changed over time. It's evolved more towards commitments rather than experiences. For example, I've added a list of commitments to finding a balance between civic engagement and entertainment. So each year I make a list of community service and civic engagements I want to be involved in. I've found it immensely rewarding to think about the things that I can do and ways that I can help. And I would encourage others to do the same thing. There are other ways to get people involved too. But whatever option you choose, what's required is almost always the same. To make people care about the world around them, you have to make the issues real. It's not enough to slide a history book in front of a student and tell them to read it. It isn't enough to talk about great challenges and using numbers and statistics. It isn't enough to say a million people die every year from malaria, or to say tens of thousands are without clean water. We have to do more than that. We've got to stop talking in abstractions. We have to make these problems feel as real as they are. Bill Gates, speaking to the World Health Assembly in 2005, touched on this issue. He said, we are rarely making eye contact with the people who are suffering. So we act sometimes as if pe the people don't exist and the suffering isn't happening. If you're from a rich country, you hear, if you bother to listen, about the back-breaking, gut-wrenching conditions in the rest of the world. But you don't see them. You can't possibly imagine them. What if, just for a moment, we could change that? What if we could, could make it so that the rich of the world live next door to the poorest of the world? They'd walk down the street and they'd say, those people are starving. Did you meet that woman over there? Her child just died. Did you see that those children over there? The youngest is having to raise her brothers. People would be shocked. They'd be moved to action. Basic instincts would kick in. They would change their priorities. I firmly believe this. You cannot create global citizens until you give people the ability to see the whole globe to see what the world actually looks like outside of their comfort zone. So how do we do that? How do we make it real? How do we make people understand what's at stake? Part of that answer, I believe, lies in technology. Technology is one of the central focuses at our foundation in large part because it can help people see what is actually going on in the world. It can show us how people are living 
and give us a personal sense of what they're dealing with. With technology, the media can see deeper into these issues and begin reporting on them with more frequency, and we've seen that a lot recently. Technology can help us too, not just see these problems, but to address them. After the Haiti earthquake, we all saw online or on TV the devastation that the Haitians were experiencing. We felt it, and we had the means to respond. Our citizens donated $31 million to the Haiti relief effort, and the vast majority of that was done using technology. There are other ways, too, to open people's eyes. I'll give you an example. The Gates Foundation is building a new campus in Seattle, Washington. It'll be open April of 2011. And we decided to put in an 11,000 square foot visitor center complete with interactive exhibits to tell compelling stories the work of our grantees and partners are doing. The goal is to engage more deeply with the thousands we expect to stop and visit the center every year. We wanted to give them a glimpse as they go about their normal lives of how others less fortunate are living theirs. These are just some ideas of how we can encourage people to be socially responsible and how we can make people feel like citizens of an interconnected society. I obviously don't have all the answers and I don't pretend to be an expert on the subject, but I did come here with experiences that helped me ask better questions. And I believe the solution to this problem, this massive problem, lies first in individuals asking themselves the right questions. So here are three questions I have for all of us. What are you personally doing to be a socially responsible global citizen? What can you do through your company or your community to become a better global citizen? And what can you do to get others involved? I can't tell you how to answer these questions for yourself, but I do know that if we are truly to foster greater global engagement, the ultimate answer will, be, will come with the combined efforts of all of us seeking these answers. For me, these answers seem to lie in breaking down the rigid barriers that have long existed between how most of us live our lives, learning, earning, returning, and how most of us uh, must live them, weaving all of these together throughout our lives. These are difficult questions to answer, but we cannot shrink from them. Because here, in Korea, in this beautiful country, we see what is possible. Today, Korea is an aid donor. In fact, it was the first OECD country that changed its status from recipient to donor. That went from understanding what it means to need help to understanding how it feels to give back. And as a donor, it's truly stunning how much Korea has given back. According to the Brookings Institute, thousands of Korean volunteers will work for foreign governments, schools, and nonprofits in 40 countries this year. That makes Korea's efforts in helping the world through volunteerism among the world's most substantial. And there are already plans to triple the size of this effort. Korea was also deeply involved in helping rebuild after the 2004 tsunami. And this country continues to be a critical player in the work to provide relief to Haiti. Korea has been involved in reconstruction efforts in Afghanistan and many other hot spots around the world. This is a community that knows what it means to be a member of a global community. It's a country that takes social responsibility to heart. There is so much to do in the world, so many problems to solve, so many crises to care for. But still, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful because I know how many good people there are in the world. I know how many there are around working to improve the lives of others. 
people fighting to eradicate disease, to end poverty and hunger, to bring clean drinking water to those that are without it, to end human rights abuses, and to make education work for everyone. There's much to do, but there's much we can do. And I'm hopeful because I know what we're capable of. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pia. Thank you uh, for your valuable and uh, impressive presentation for us. And now we're going to start the discussions from the, our designated discussion first, and then we open for the floor for the discussions. How about uh, George, Joseph Forrest? You want to start first? Sure. Um, well, it was a pleasure to hear two very thought-provoking and, uh, in fact, very optimistic and idealistic points of view about, about where the world can be or where it should be. And I think, if I may say in a, in a musical term, the leitmotif or the, uh, the train of thought that went through both talks had to do with quality of life, with global citizenship, social responsibility. But I was particularly taken with Jeffrey's words about losing our way, losing our focus on, on human beings, because um, uh, much of what I do as the president of Juilliard, which is an institution dedicated to educating the next generation of actors, dancers, and musicians, is to think about the context within which they uh, will perform at some point, and also to tell them how important a role they have uh, in our culture, in our world society. And when Jeffrey mentioned the point about that economic terms are so often used as the vocabulary of, of our day, it, it really uh, is absolutely true, and it also in many ways um, negates uh, issues having to do with the arts, with the humanities, because um, in fact, within our environment, quite often, uh, not only in the public, but in, in the intelligentsia, in university college settings, uh, if if it's not about economics, if it's not about business, if it's not about uh, the hard sciences, it's soft. And, and the softest of all, the softest of all experiences is the arts. And, and, and the softness, when I say that word, softness, I mean that the perception is that there's no intellectual rigor or content within the arts, or that it is expendable, or it is a as a, an element of our society that, although interesting and engaging for some people, is certainly not necessary. And as I have said so often during my time as president of Juilliard, um, I take the absolute opposite position in reference to that, as I, I believe my colleagues do as well, and that is that the arts can be a restorative, can be a powerful and profoundly important role play an important role in the quality of life of our citizens, rich and poor, uh, around the world. And that it's not just through presentations, concerts, and that sort of thing, which is the normal way that one would think about arts, but, but rather through education. That, um, that the art should be an essential part of the curricula of primary and secondary schools throughout the world. And, um, this is not uh, happening, regrettably. It's certainly not happening in the United States. And uh, in my experiences, it's not really happening very uniformly at countries uh, around the world as well. When we talk about building better citizenship, as Francie spoke of, and social responsibility, there is a particular responsibility, in my view, that artists have. And I wrote a book in 2005 called The Artist is Citizen, that essentially suggests that the life of the artist, does, the public life of the artist does not stop at the end of a concert or a presentation or a play or a dance concert. It actually just begins there. That artists have to become part of communities. They have to be effective advocates uh, for the role of the arts and the restorative quality of the arts within our society. And in fact, the core values that you both spoke of 
uh, about social responsibility are often uh, depicted in works of art. There, there's an extraordinary play that was written uh, in 1958-59 uh, that was specifically related to uh, race relations in America. It's a, it also became a famous movie called A Raisin in the Sun. This was the first play by an African-American author that was ever produced uh, on Broadway and uh, was directed by Lloyd Richards, who became uh, one of the great directors of, our, of America's tradition in drama. And it also became, in many ways, the precursor for work by America's probably most prominent African-American playwright, August Wilson. The reason I'm mentioning it is that here is a work of art in 1958 uh, done by our actors at Juilliard that brought up issues of equality, uh, interpersonal relationships, perceptions of differences and how one deals with them, and human dignity. Well, I would say if you dedicated the two hours that it took, to that, took for that play to take place, if you concentrated there, I can't ask for a better way of spending your time in understanding what the human condition is all about. So we tell our students that they are not just artists, they're not just bassoonists as I am or an actor or a dancer. They are leaders and they are communicators. They are communicators of human values. And I believe that the quality of our life from my perspective and what I'm, I've dedicated my life to uh, has to do uh, with a greater integration of the arts in our educational system. And if we can do that, I think that our world will be a better place and I'll, I think, expand upon that idea. I know I'll expand upon that idea in my talk tomorrow. Uh, but I, I am distressed that not only are is our vocabulary so economically driven, but that the arts are so undervalued in so many ways around our world. And I, I hope that will change and um, that we can integrate it into our, into our societies in a much more effective way. Well, thank you. Uh, well, Tony, you waited so long, so it's now your <laughs> turn. Thank you. May I add my thanks to all three of our participants so far, some very interesting thoughts. I'm particularly struck by the reference uh, Francie Phelan made to the interconnectedness of things, whether it's that triangle of learning, earning and returning, or whether it's feeling connected with the broader world. The, British, the new government in Britain has, as one of its main themes, the idea of what is called the big society. And this is an issue that is close to the heart of the new Prime Minister, David Cameron, and really what he is talking about is exactly this idea that we need to recapture, regenerate in our society an idea that things do connect and that we all have a part to play. To paraphrase the 17th century English poet John Donne, no man is an island. We are all part of each other. But there's a problem here. And the problem is that we live in a deeply fragmented, atomized society, and in particular, our education system reflects that. When I talk to my students, I have to be honest with them. They're bright, they understand it. They know, for example, that for entry to a top competitive UK university these days, the only thing that matters, the only thing that will matter is the paper grade they have from a public examination. Nothing else counts at all. But also they know, or at least I hope they know, that by the time they leave university, what will matter is not the academic paper qualification at all, not one jot, because there will be many thousands of students with similar grades. What will then matter is all the experiences and all the activities in which they have been engaged through school life and beyond school. Now this is a kind of double standard, a kind of double think. And it has become more marked, certainly in my time in education over the last 35 years. Society seems to demand bite-sized chunks of intense deep knowledge and expertise which can be employed in various parts 
of the workplace. So the very fact that the British government feels the need to restate this belief in big society seems to me to reveal the depth of the problem. Now there is a way in which I think schools can help and be a significant part of rejoining these fragments. Schools should be true to their core values, and it's very interesting how frequently that phrase has come up in the course of the last hour, that it's those core values that matter. I have seen so many times, particularly over the last two decades in the UK, new fads and fashions coming into education. One year it's well-being courses, the next year it's citizenship courses. And my belief is that whereas a well-being program may be a necessary short-term expedient, it's an admission of failure. Because the way a school or a society runs itself should embody and represent attitudes to well-being or to good citizenship, which don't need the telling. They just are. They come through the way people behave and respond to one another. But I'll say this about schools. I think there are two very important lessons about teaching teenagers which have dawned on me over the years. The first is this, that in my experience, teenagers learn more outside the classroom than they ever learn inside it. And the second is that they learn more from each other than they ever learn from a teacher. And it seems to me what a good school tries to do is to create the environment in which those two things happen positively and well. And when you do have these things happening positively and well, then it lends itself to creating a curriculum which is all-embracing. I have come seriously to dislike the phrase extracurricular because it implies something that is bolted on or added on. But as we've just heard from Joseph, the arts have a fundamental part to play in the totality of a curriculum, as does uh, the sports program or any other creative activity. It should be seen as one whole. And the other aspect of communities in education, which is very important, I think, is to properly embrace the fullness of relationships pastoral care, if you like. Certainly at my school, we spend a great deal of time talking to students individually, talking to them in groups. It's not always time apparently well spent, but it is hugely significant that any community of people, be it a school, a college, a society, should value relationships more than anything else. It is the human interconnection from which everything else springs. I think I'll leave it there for the moment. Thank you. We'll have time to discuss more. Uh, it's uh, Jeffrey and Francis. Do you have any comment to add to the discussion? Well, the only thing that I wanted to add, I, I wouldn't disagree with what, what's been shared by our discussants. Uh, I don't think that we've talked enough about uh, the relationship piece, the interpersonal piece. You know, in human resources, and I've, I've been a head of HR for a good share of organizations representing different industries, and you, you know, the mistake we make is we hire based on the subject matter expertise, but uh, to use the flip side, we'll fire based on the lack of interpersonal or... Uh, um, the softer skills, if you will. And so it's clear to me, it's absolutely clear to me that we need both, we need to value both, and whatever's causing us to um, lessen the value of those interpersonal skills, we need, to, we, we need to attack that, quite frankly. I would echo the comments on the importance of you know, the arts and culture, and it goes to this issue of the things that aren't readily measured, uh, get devalued. And there's a wonderful line, which of course I can't remember uh, anymore, but it goes, it's, it's, it's a line from John uh, Stein's, one of the Steinbeck novels, where he talks about a fish, and you know, and then talks about the fish in terms of its um, 
kind of its metrics, how much it weighs and the scales and the color and its, you know, uh, the chemical composition. And then he goes on to point out uh, that to the fishermen, uh, that uh, those scientific measures convey nothing of the magnificence of that fish, you know, thrashing about in the sea at the end of the line, and so on and so forth. And and so I think, you know, I think we have we have lost in our society, and I think it's a really a wonderful reflection on the United States, which has spread not only its bad management practices, but also kind of its bad ways of thought uh, around the world, uh, this emphasis on kind of economics and quantification uh, to the exclusion of everything else. And we, and we live in a society which is increasingly, I think, uncivilized because we don't have arts uh, or have a proper appreciation for the arts. Um, in, as you know, as my colleagues know, uh, in the United States, uh, when schools have budget problems, uh, the arts, I think, go even before athletics. And, uh, and so in many schools and school districts, if you want arts, you have to pay extra, and uh, many parents can't or won't. And so when my dear friend and Rudy Crew became chairman of uh, New York City schools under Mayor Giuliani in the late 1990s, uh, there were no arts programs in New York City schools. And as he said, you couldn't find a trombone in New York City uh, except in the uh, magnet schools or the schools for the arts. And I, you know, and that I think is a, a cultural impoverishment that we should no longer tolerate. So I certainly agree with that. Okay, thank you for your comment and speeches. Finally, it's time for you for audience. Uh, you must have many questions to ask during the morning session, but you all missed the opportunities in the morning. But now you have time, about uh, 10 minutes, I think, so we can take about uh, three or four questions to, to the speakers or discussant. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, raise your hand and uh, let us know your name and affiliations, and then make clear your question and shot. And then please identify to whom you are asking. So uh, this floor is too dark. So would you write on a little bit and then we can see who is asking. Anyone who has a question, please raise your hand and then I can assign you. OK. Where is the microphone, please? Give microphone for the front seats. Okay, uh, uh, my name is Dong Wu Khan. Uh, I'm from uh, Chongqing Minnan National Academy. And I have one question for the uh, uh, Mr. Tony Ledo. And you mentioned that the uh, uh, students in the uh, uh, teenage high school uh, learn outside more than inside and they learn from uh, uh, each other than the uh, teachers. Then what might be the uh, uh, role of teachers in the school system? That's my question. Thank you. I can sense that you uh, must be a teacher worried about your job. I am a teacher, and I believe passionately in the significance and importance of teachers, so you can be rest assured on that count. What I'm suggesting is that we need to change focus in our understanding of what teaching is, good teaching. Over the next 10 or 20 years, particularly with the advent of new technologies, the nature of the classroom will change. And the notion that the teacher can stand there directing the traffic like a policeman being the central point of focus in the classroom, telling students what to do, will go. It will no longer be relevant. Now, this is going to be a seismic shift for many teachers. Teachers are going to have to come to a better understanding that it is the purpose of a good teacher to create the atmosphere, to create the environment in which young people can learn for themselves, to develop their own intellectual abilities, but also in collaboration with other students. So it is a shift of emphasis. I see this happening very well in some schools in some parts of the world, rather less well in other parts of the world. But this is going to be a little short of a revolution in global terms in the way we think about teaching. And I believe that the 
two axioms I gave, which I believe hold good in all periods of time, that young people learn more from each other and that they learn more outside the formal structures of a classroom, I believe those two axioms are going to be seen to be central to the way we run our schools in years to come. Yes, is there any other questions? Yes, please give microphone to the front of seats. Here. Yes, my name is Donovan Loomis. I am a graduate student at Sung Yunguan University. My question is directed to the Human Resources Management Director at Bill Gates Foundation and towards Tony Little. Um, Mr. Little, you touched on the importance of personal relationship. As a one-time English teacher in Korea, I noticed that no matter the technology or teaching ability, one of the, you might say, greatest impacts on education was relationship, how much the teacher cared about the student. And I noticed that the personal relationship, you might say, the family effect kind of outweighed the benefits of education. So you touched on social responsibility. How, as educators, can we address social responsibility if we have students lacking good family foundations and lacking quality personal relationships? To whom? Who going to respond? Well, the, the first step in terms of families is that it seems to me incumbent on schools and teachers to get to know families. Now, this may seem an obvious point, uh, but in my experience, it is often far from the case. In the UK, for example, there are many schools who will write reports on young students seeking entry to my school who, when asked the question or when asked to give some information about the child's family context, either refuse to give the information or don't know. This seems to me an abrogation of responsibility. Good schools and good teachers should come alongside families. That is time well spent understanding in some detail the child's particular circumstances. If all schools and all teachers were to spend that time to engage with families, I think that we, we would see a very significant step forward along the lines you've been suggesting. Okay, yes, next year to that. Yes, go ahead. Oh, you want to? Yeah, I was going to follow up just with a, a minor sure. point. Um, what can it, what can educators do uh, to help move the needle on the interpersonal side and the social responsibility side? You know, I think there's there's individuals. Uh, you're focused on the student as an individual within the classroom, but there's also education needed uh, peripherally to that individual, that student's family, and also the the community, the smaller community in which the school exists and the corporations that also populate that same geographical area. And so if we think really creatively, what can we do as educators to have events that draw in community, corporations, families together, maybe that we haven't seen before, that would be a, a discussion like this perhaps? Can there be literature that, uh, or, or worksheets, I'm just thinking off the top of my head, that kids take home to discuss at the dinner table with their families? What are our core values, mom, dad? Uh, I'd like to sit in on one of those and just hear the conversation. But I, I think if we think creatively, if you think of your job as educators extending beyond the individual in front of you, and you think in terms of your job as educating those that are in that geographic community, including the corporations, then I think the world starts to open up. These interconnections that we're talking about start to become a little more visible. So your turn. Please identify your name and affiliations. I am Kelvin Kim from IGM, Institute of Global Management. I will, I'd like to ask a question to Professor Jeffrey Pfeffer. Uh, it seems like that business uh, educational institutes are more and more aware of the business needs. So it seems like the more and more universities are driven by the request from business entities that you have to produce this kind of specific uh, talents with this kind of competencies. Having said that, 
more, more and more companies are asking, are telling that people are their greatest assets, but it seems like that even though they say people, it is not people, average people. Only key talented people, segmented group of the total employees. So um, I have concern. Even though you believe that people are important, it seems like people have different grades according to their contribution to the business world. So what would you like to say? Would you think that this stream of thought will continue or do you think that it will change over the time? So I don't do futures forecasting because I'm not very good at it and most people aren't. Um, so I have no idea what will continue. It is interesting when you think about companies that try to pick talent. I point out to them uh, that in the, the American, uh, American football, which is called football, some, some places that would be soccer, but you know, uh, American football, uh, one of the most valuable players uh, is Kurt Warner, quarterback, first for the Arizona Cardinals, prior to that for the St. Louis team. Kurt Warner has consistently been underestimated. Michael Jordan was cut by his high school basketball coach because he was considered to be unable uh, to play basketball. Companies, I think, have way too much confidence in their ability to both identify and let alone predict who is going to be talented. Um, and uh, by the way, the great organizations that I have seen achieve extraordinary results uh, from quite ordinary people, which is actually the subtitle of a book I wrote with my colleague uh, Charles O'Reilly. Uh, so yes, I hear companies increasingly, uh, you know, do this ABC grading thing. Um, there's a lot of evidence that suggests uh, that that's harmful in a variety of different ways, and also they're not very good at it. By the way, if you want to be highly rated by your boss, uh, the evidence suggests that the best way to be highly rated your, by your boss is to be hired by that person. Uh, because uh, they'll be committed to the decision that they made in, in, in hiring you. Uh, so yes, there is all this top grading and all this other stuff. Uh, I just don't see much evidence to suggest uh, that the companies are very accurate at doing it or that it's very helpful. Uh, the best organizations that I've seen worry about developing everybody uh, to their full potential, just as the best schools take every student and the best uh, theater organizations and the best music organizations uh, take everyone and move them as far as they can humanly possible rather than saying, you know, well, uh, you deserve to be developed and you don't. Okay, I think we have time for one last question. Yes. I that want could to be the last one. I want to speak in Korea. And Uh, 프랜시 피란 그 빌게이츠 재단 사장님께 질문 드리겠습니다. 네, 저는 고려대학교 컴퓨터학과 안영아입니다. 오늘 그 어, 피렌, 어, 피란의 가, 강의를 듣고 세상에 변화를 줄수 있는 사람이라는 기대가 생겨서 상당히 기쁘고요. 특히 그 아까 아메리카노라는 지역사회를 이해하는 그 미국을 위해 가르치라는 프로그램을 말씀하셨는데 제가 당장 이 강의를 듣고 작은 실천이나마 할수 있는 일이 바로 이 한국을 위해서 무언가를 가르치는 일일 텐데 제가 살고 있는 지역사회에서 어떤 식으로 그 일을 할지 좀 궁금해서 그 미국을 위해 가르치라는 프로그램에 대해서 좀더 자세하게 알고 싶습니다. So thank you for your kind remarks. Um, Teach for America, like I had shared, uh, it is, it's fairly new for us. And uh, what I would suggest, rather than going to detail here, I mean, um, we could either chat after this, but I would also have you visit our um, gatesfoundation.org website for Teach for America information. I know enough about it to know that it was a, a highly successful program, that the kids that got into it, um, it, 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 uh, 
it motivated them because they were using skills that they had, but it largely motivated them because they could see the effects that they were having and the passion that they were driving from uh, those that they were working with. And so it's that combination of you know, getting to do something, getting to use your skill set very early on, but also seeing the, just the massive effect, seeing the positive effects from it. And that blend has kept two-thirds of the 20,000 that got started in it in education today. So um, um, there's more probably written on it than I have, than I'm even knowledgeable of. And so I'd be happy to, to talk with you after this session. Or if any of my colleagues have more information on Teach for America, I'd, um, but, uh, but a great program and, and uh, one that really fulfills that um, sense of, of social responsibility and uh, earning, learning, and returning all at the same time. So there's a, a similar scheme in the UK started a few years ago called Teach First, run on similar principles. I think it is actually the best thing that has happened in British education for the last couple of decades. Okay, now it's time to close. Uh, I hope this session was uh, valuable and helpful to all of us. Uh, let us give big hands to, uh, to the speakers and discussants.